Hello and welcome to the Open Heat Transfer Course Conduction. This course is brought to you by RDVUTH Aachen University and the University of Twente. My name is Wilco Roves and in this video we will tackle the problem of conduction in a multi-layer plane wall. The learning goals in this video are twofold. First of all, we will provide you a fundamental understanding of temperature profiles inside multi-layer plane walls under steady state conditions. In a second step, we would like to give you the tools to calculate the heat flux through such a multi-layer wall by using the concept of thermal resistances. Multi-layer plane walls are seen in our daily life in many situations. Here, one example is a brick wall consisting of multiple layers, such as here, an insulating layer in between two different stone walls. And if we want to look at this in a schematic way, we have here three different layers of different properties. And here for us, the important thermal property is the thermal conductivity. And we are interested in the heat loss as such, the Q dot, which is the heat transferred through the entire wall. We can replace the wall example simply by other examples, for instance, here a battery stack. Also in this case, multiple layers of different material cure. And here the same question, what is the heat flux through this multi-component wall? A few important assumptions and considerations that we need to discuss before we start calculating. So one important condition that we have is a steady state condition. There is no change in temperature in the entire wall. So the boundary conditions, the temperatures T1 and T2 are uh, existing on such a long time scale, such as that the temperature, have, uh, temperature profile has reached a steady state condition. The second condition is that we look at the one-dimensional heat transport. This is also important to make things easier for the first calculations. The material properties here, lambda 1, lambda 2, and lambda 3, are known and constant in each of the materials, and the cross-sectional area is constant. Now, let us come to the example that we started with, this multi-layer wall, the house wall. We have sand line brick here in the one part, we have a thermal insulation layer in between, and we have the outer brick on the other side. The thermal conductivities are completely different of the materials, and as such, um, we will have also a different um, temperature differences, driving potentials. So we have here on the one side, the temperature profile. I just drew this profile, not knowing if it's the right one, but we can see from the thermal conductivities that there is a lower thermal conductivity in the, in the isolation. So we guess that the thermal, the temperature needs to be uh, increasing the temperature difference. And then the thermal conductivity of material number three is uh, in this case very high. So the temperature profile is nearly flat. Why is this the case? And that's what we want to teach you in this video. So why do the discontinuities occur here on these uh, boundaries? There is a discontinuity in the temperature profile. And for this, we have to go back to Fourier's law. Fourier's law states that the heat flux Q is equal to the negative of the temperature gradient multiplied by the thermal uh, conductivity and the area. Now we have three heat fluxes in this wall. We can associate a heat flux going through the first layer, Q dot one. We have a heat flux through the second layer, Q dot two, and we have a heat flux through the last layer, number three. Important is now that we are under steady state conditions, which means that the heat that is going into our object on the left side will be the same heat that is uh, going out of the object on the right side. This means, in conjunction, that the heat transferred through each of these layers is constant. 
So q.1 is equal to q.2 is equal to q.3. This is a very important um, implication from the steady state temperature profile or steady state condition. And on the first glance, it might be a little bit counterintuitive because the thermal conductivity of material three is much larger than the thermal conductivity of material two. But there is no source, um, there is no heat generated or lost in one of those layers. And as such, the only way that this can happen is that the heat fluxes are equal. Now, the discontinuity occurs because next to the fact that the heat fluxes are constant, we also have a change in the material properties. So Fourier's law can only work if, in case that the thermal conductivity increases, the temperature gradient needs to decrease in the same manner. And as such, we have here where the thermal conductivity is very high, a low slope, and in the other case, where the thermal conductivity is lower, we have a higher slope. And directly at the crossover of the two different materials, there is a discontinuity in the material properties. And as such, there is also a discontinuity in the temperature profile. Now, we already talked about the fact that the heat flux is constant in each of those layers, a very important implication. So we can now state that Fourier's law in each layer is equal to the equation given above. So note, we have not a minus in here, but therefore we have changed the temperatures T1 minus T2 instead of T2 minus T1. Um, the heat flow in layer one depends on the thermal conductivity of layer one, the thickness of layer one and the temperature, the driving potential between the location two and the location one. The same applies to all other three layers as well, uh, two layers as well. So we have just changed the material property and the thickness and of course the driving potential. Now we see that we have temperature two in here, temperature two in here, we have temperature three in here and temperature three in there. Knowing with this condition that the heat fluxes are constant, we can just equalize those two equations and re remove some of the unknowns. I would like to do this now here exemplary for the three layer wall. So from equation two with the heat flux in layer two, we can explicitly write T2 as a function of T3 and the material properties of um, body two. The same we can do with the uh, in the inside layer three with the temperature three relying on temperature four and the properties of the layer three. Now we can simply replace T3 in equation two and we get a connection between temperature two and temperature four and we have two times the heat flux which is equal and of course the two different resistances here um, one caused by layer two and the other one caused by layer three. Now we can also use this equation to eliminate T2 in equation one. And with that, we come up with an equation that connects temperature one and temperature four, which are known in our case with all the resistances in the three layers. The equation here, equation five, we can now rearrange to have an explicit equation for the heat flux Q, which we would like to calculate. So we exclude Q from the brackets here and bring it over, and we get a very um, clear equation or clean equation where we have a Q is equal to the area divided by now the sum of delta one divided by lambda plus delta two divided by lambda plus delta three divided by lambda. So these are now three resistances which determine the total resistance of the wall. And of course, the driving potential is now T1 minus T4. Summarizing this, we have the flow Q, the reciprocal of resistances here, the area of course, and the driving potential. It looks like what we know from um, electrotechniques where we have the electric flux equal to a 
driving potential divided by a resistance. Now, because it's so similar to electric fluxes, we can also look at this as thermal resistors in series. So we have T1 connected to T4 by the three different resistances R1, R2 and R3. The C here stands for conduction and of course the number for the number of the layer. So from that we can make an equation that is valid for an n layer wall by just adding more resistances up to the power of n and we get that the resistance C in total is equal to the sum from 1 to n of the single resistances and we can replace the resistance by delta i divided by a i and lambda i. Now I already uh, discussed or started discussing that the heat flux is very similar to the um, electricity flux i. So the flow or flux is equal to the driving potential divided by the resistances. So in an electric circuit this i divided is equal to the potential u divided by the total resistances and here also for resistances in series it is the same game we have our total is equal to the sum of the single resistances and in heat transfer in a multi-layer wall it is exactly the same that our resistance is equal to the sum of all resistances and then the resistance is defined here um, by delta i divided by i i times lambda i we see that this is the reciprocal of the um, um, part that is in front of Fourier's law and there it is the reciprocal of the resistance. So it's exactly the same game and as such we can calculate the heat flux as the driving potential, temperature potential between the layer one and the nth layer at the end and the total conductive resistance. This is already the end of this uh, video of multi-layer plane walls without heat fluxes and under steady state conditions. So a few questions. Uh, first of all, what is the course of the temperature profile in a flat wall without heat sources and things in steady state? This we have already tackled in the lecture before. So in a flat wall with these assumptions, the temperature profile is a straight line. Under which conditions can it be assumed that the heat flow remains constant in all layers? This is a very important implication that we use to calculate the heat flux. And this assumption is valid under steady state conditions. So there are no changes in temperature anymore. There is, in addition, the fact that the, there are no heat sources or heat sinks which increase the heat flux over the course when the heat travels through the wall. Now finally, how is the thermal resistance of a plane wall defined and how can the thermal resistance be calculated for a, a wall of n layers? So let's look at the equations here which are showing that the heat flux is of course equal to the one over the resistances times the driving potential and the total resistance in a network of um, resistances in series is just the sum of the resistances and this is equal then um, to the delta so the uh, thickness of the wall divided by the area and the thermal conductivity. We see here in this equation that the thermal conductivity will if it increases, reduce the thermal resistance. So this is also something that we know from gut feeling. And if we increase the thickness of the wall, then of course we increase the resistance. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Have a nice day and see you in the next video.